Uh, thanks, Dr. Cha, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and really, this project would have not been possible without Dr. Cha and the Korea Chairs. Just incredible support for us over the past two years when we're working on this. Um, and Dr. Cha had, you know, always had trust and patience in us throughout this rather long journey. And we're also incredibly fortunate to have had not just one, but two, you know, great experts in the field guide us through the process. Um, so without further ado, we're going to just jump right into the presentation. So as Dr. Cha said, uh, the impetus for this project came um, after uh, the March 2013 uh, cyber attack against South Korean banks and media agencies, uh, which is more commonly called uh, as Dark Soul in the States. So as we tried to look into sort of why North Korea would do such a thing and how they were how they were able to do what they did, uh, we realized that there really wasn't much uh, comprehensive literature on the field that we can you know, refer to as an authoritative source. And so that became sort of the impetus for uh, embarking on this project. Um, and we thought this was worth paying more attention to for basically two reasons. Uh, one was that uh, for people who study North Korea, this is basically a new emerging capability that's geared towards exploiting uh, US and ROK's asymmetric vulnerabilities. Uh, and for who, people who study cyber issues, uh, North Korea's cyber activity uh, could be an important case study for characterizing and dealing with uh, state-sponsored cyber operations in general. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, these are a series of cyber attacks that have been commonly associated with North Korea with sort of varying degrees of uh, certainty and attribution. Um, while we won't get into the technical weeds of each incident, we can generally sort of see that in a matter of few years, these operations have been evolving from, you know, rather simple DDoS attacks uh, to more complex operations that are um, diversifying in attack methods, greater in impact, uh, which sometimes resulting in um, damage of property, and also uh, those that require extensive prior preparation. So while these still can't be characterized as the most complex cyber operations that are out there, we can clearly see that there's a trend uh, that these operations are getting better and that their uh, methods are maturing. Uh, so our goal uh, for today's presentation is basically two things. Uh, one's to take these individual incidents and place them under strategic context so that we know uh, why they do this and what they want out of it. Uh, second is to see uh, who or what organizations uh, were responsible for conducting these operations uh, so that we understand uh, what these attacks are a continuation of and where they might be headed in the future. And so our approach is to have a sort of a top-down strategic perspective on this issue, and that's what our presentation will mostly focus on today. So we'll pass it on to Scott. So we'll jump right into the strategic context of the situation. Um, we're going to look at North Korea's st national strategy and how it sort of governs these cyber operations. Um, North Korea's uh, cyber strategy is basically an extension of existing national strategy. Um, very broadly, it involves upsetting the current status quo on the Korean peninsula, which is highly unfavorable to North Korea, um, via smaller provocations that fall short of war uh, in pursuit of of, of rebalancing things into a slightly more favorable situation each time, um, all while making sure that uh, escalation is manageable and is prevented from spiraling out of control or into something that North Korea cannot control, manage, or let alone win. Um, North Korea's uh, use of cyber operations comes from two general conceptual roots. These are the ability to conduct irregular operations during peacetime, uh, and the ability to conduct disruptive conventional operations during wartime. This means that during peacetime, uh, the DPRK looks to coerce or disrupt the ROK and US without starting a war it cannot win. This means that in wartime, it's looking to disrupt conventional military operations in a way that sharply reduces the ROK and US strategies, uh, effectiveness of its strategy at large. Uh, we'll discuss this more in following sections because there's a lot to unpack in that statement. Um, these are two existing traditions uh, in which we think new cyber means will support the existing national strategy and that it's a logical progression for North Korea to be adopting these and deepening their investments in. Uh, in general, North Korean strategy, as we said, is simply to exploit their stronger opponents' weak points while minimizing their own uh, risk and losses. 
The DPRK's position in the world and on the Korean Peninsula in particular is fairly poor compared to the U.S. and ROK, and it looks to find a way to upset the strength of, of the, some call it overwhelming strength that it's, it's dealing with uh, via asymmetric means. In peacetime, this manifests itself in the various non-conventional operations that the DPRK has performed over the years. Uh, this includes the violent commando raids that characterized the 60s and 70s uh, and the highly politically charged ballistic missile tests of today. Um, these go beyond purely military and hard power games, though these are very important, and includes the diplomatic and political offensive we saw, offensives we've seen throughout the past few decades even. Um, in wartime, this generally means just disrupting operations, um, or this means conducting disruptive operations aimed at upsetting and in a sense staggering U.S. and ROK forces so that DPRK's aging conventional forces would stand a fighting chance. Uh, we're focusing more on peacetime than wartime, though there is an important wartime component for this strategy. Um, which Ginny will touch on in a moment. Uh, peacetime is the, def the default setting for the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it is a tense peace, but it is peace, and thus it, peacetime operations are the more salient thing to examine. Uh, the DPRK, I'm sorry, the ROK and U.S. have pulled ahead of the DPR DPRK and are diplomatically, economically, and militarily dominant. Uh, this has been the case for many years now, and as such, uh, the DPRK aims to change the status quo. Conventional military operations on the peninsula are very risky um, due to the deadlock along the DMZ that everyone's familiar with. Um, and as such, if the DPRK aims to upset the status quo, it must do so by sidestepping these conventional deadlock. Um, cyber is the nat natural progression of this sidestepping strategy. Uh, it minimizes risk, but still allows them to maintain, at least for the time being, some plausible deniability, and a means of exerting influence on both the United States and ROK without risking escalation. Um, as the ROK has continued to develop uh, engagement strategy and rules uh, of engagement that have slowly closed off some of the more conventional and violent means of upsetting the status quo, uh, the DPRK is forced to look for new capabilities, and we believe the cyber capabilities are that uh, new pursuit. Uh, cyber is both a natural and desirable progression for the North Korean asymmetric capabilities. So I'll sort of elaborate a little more um, before we go into uh, the wartime strategy, a little more on why, you know, North Korea is relying on cyber means um, in addition to their, you know, traditional means. Um, so uh, the U.S. and ROK are much more reliant on cyberspace for nearly sort of all aspects of national activity, whereas the disruption of cyberspace does not really mean much to North Korea. So that's uh, so, sort of an asymmetric uh, situation that the DPRK uh, uh, can, can exploit. And so coupled with that is the sort of the current dynamic where the, in cyberspace, the defenders need to, needs to constantly protect and monitor a wide variety of systems and networks, and also defend a wide range of attack vectors whereas the attackers have relatively more freedom in choosing when, where, and how to attack. And so this makes defense uh, costly and cumbersome and the offense relatively cheap and easy. So in this sense, cyber operations also offers a sort of a low operational risk compared to other means uh, that traditionally DPRK has relied on, which is sort of artillery fire or commando raids, as Scott mentioned, as a sort of a way to sidestep the deadlock in the peninsula. So uh, low operational risk because it's not only less costly to plan and execute a cyber attack, but in the case the cyber attack fails, uh, there are few economic and diplomatic sort of costs involved with that compared to stuff like assassination attempts. Um, as Scott talked about, uh, DPRK has plausible deniability in these cases, uh, exacerbated by our problems in successfully attributing these attacks to a significant amount, or sometimes our inability to publicly disclose the evidence, even when we're actually successful in attributing these attacks. Um, also, finally, there's a lack of consensus on how to respond to such a cyber attack uh, internationally, and there's also a time delay associated with attribution, and both of these mean that North Korea can generally worry less about retaliation when conducting a cyber operation. Uh, so with that, I'll Let's move on to their wartime strategy. 
Uh, we also believe that North Korea may in the future make an effort to integrate cyber uh, means as a supporting element in their wartime strategy as well. Although uh, right now in the public sphere, we're seeing more of the sort of the former type of operations uh, in peacetime. We still think that thinking about their wartime cyber strategy is important for uh, basically defense planning purposes to avoid surprise. Uh, so North Korea's wartime strategy uh, traditionally has involved the concept of a quick war, a quick end, uh, or which means sokjeon sokgyal in Korean, which can be generally described as a blitzkrieg strategy. So the goal is to conduct a series of quick maneuver operations penetrating deep into enemy lines, that's, uh, and the goal is to bring about a sudden strategic collapse of the enemy rather than aspiring to sort of completely defeat his forces. And under this strategy, a really important component for the success, uh, success of this uh, strategy is the ability to disrupt uh, enemy operations in C4ISR, as well as the, because it supports their decision cycles. Uh, and this is really important, especially for fighting against a modern network military that's reliant on these uh, technologies. And so for a long time, um, DPRK uh, would do this through uh, the KPA Special Forces or the Light Infantry Bureau. And more recently, we've seen electronic warfare elements uh, being integrated to this larger strategy. Uh, one example is uh, during the shelling of Yampyeong Island in 2010, uh, North Korea deliberately jammed South Korean radars before firing their own artillery. So these all fit really well within North Korea's military doctrine that emphasizes joint operations and combined arms warfare. And along this line of thought, it's reasonable to sort of deduce that North Korea will want to incorporate cyber as a new means of disrupting enemy C4ISR during a conflict. Um, this, you know, if it's successful, could have a negative impact on both the U.S. and ROK's ability to operate uh, in a timely and effective manner during a conflict. And although uh, a general war is really hard to imagine in the 21st century in the Korean Peninsula, I mean, these things are important for those who are interested in defense and contingency planning because we want to avoid uh, general surprise when, when we're faced with these kinds of conflicts. So now that we've established a general st strategic context, uh, we'd like to take a look at the specific details of the organizations which conduct these attacks. Uh, this is one of our means of figuring out the potential missions and goals uh, of North Korea going forward. North Korea does not publish its strategy or doctrine uh, for obvious reasons, and as such, we're left to uh, deductive investigation, especially of its institutions and leadership. Um, to help figure out the general missions and purposes of, the, of DPRK cyber units, we've examined uh, all of the organizations that, these, that have received government attribution or association with uh, cyber operations. We've taken a look. These are the, these, the main two overarching organizations in this case are the Reconnaissance General Bureau and the General Staff Department of the Korean People's Army. Uh, these, we take, we, after identifying these organizations, we took a look at these organizations' previous activities. We've identified their leadership. We've identified as much of their organization as, and structure as is possible within open source literature. And based on these, we've tried to build a trend under the assumption that if we know where an orga what an organization has done, what it's doing, who is leading it, and how it's structured, we can paint a general picture of what it should be doing in the future. Oh. Uh, so we'll first start off by talking about the Reconnaissance General Bureau, uh, which has been attributed uh, by South Korean government uh, for the Dark Soul attack and by the U.S. government for the Sony incident. Uh, so the RGB is rel a relatively new organization in North Korea, formed around 2009, as basically a, a one-stop shop for intelligence, covert operations, commando and special forces infiltrations, illicit arms trade, and, and the list goes on. And the general goal of this organization seems to be to use a variety of means at their disposal to exert influence on the Korean Peninsula in peacetime and to find ways to incrementally increase North Korea's leverage over South Korea. And as you can see, the RGB is, is not created from scratch, but it's actually a combined entity of many intelligence and covert operations units previously scattered across the North Korean government. Uh, so these predecessor organizations have been involved in activities uh, historically, such as um, raiding the Blue House uh, in 1968, uh, 
bombing in Rangoon in 1983, and also many submarine infiltrations of commando and human units into South Korea. And the general mission seems to continue even after 2009 uh, when we see incidents uh, such as thinking of the Cheonan in 2010. Um, basically, the key takeaway is that the RGB is much more than just an intelligence organization, and the RGB is frequently and routinely involved in a range of activities encompassing low-intensity attacks, covert operations, espionage, as well as crime. So under this general context comes in Bureau 121, uh, which is the main organization which seems to be in charge of cyber operations within the North Korean government. Uh, in recent years, uh, the South Korean media outlets have reported that Bureau 121 is now, um, is also alternatively identified as the Cyber Warfare Guidance Bureau, or uh, for those of you who speak Korean, Cyber Jeon Chidogok in Korean. Um, also, the uh, similar reports have also said that uh, Bureau 121, or Pegishvil Kuk, uh, also used to be called Unit 121, or Pegishvil So. Um, and these, if these reports are true, uh, then we think that this organ uh, could have been promoted or, or increased in emphasis over the course of just a few years. Uh, we don't know exactly why, uh, but it could be that these operations, uh, cyber operations, were regarded as quite successful within the government or that there has been sort of a top-down decision that placed a greater emphasis on cyber missions overall. Uh, BR-121 is no, most known in the public as conducting these high-profile and disruptive cyber operations, as we saw in slide three. Uh, but we also believe that they're also involved in cyber espionage and cyber crime. Um, here, we had initially ruled out espionage and crime as sort of outside the scope of our research because we we're focusing on disruptive cyber attacks. Uh, but as we dug deeper into operations of Bureau 121, we found out that they actually dip a lot into cyber crime, uh, not just to generate revenue, but also as a means to use the victims as a vector for further attacks. Uh, one example was in 2012, uh, where a South Korean law enforcement agency discovered that RGB agents were using fake identities as software engineers, and they were selling malware-infected gambling software to South Koreans. And also, as early as a few weeks ago, RGB agents were discovered operating uh, illegal gambling websites online. And we think this connection between cyber crime and disruptive cyber attacks are an important part of North Korea cyber operations and are worthy of further research. Um, in short, uh, the RGB in general wages uh, peacetime irregular operations against South Korea uh, and sometimes the US. And Bureau 121 seems to be their cyber element of this larger strategy. And one quick organizational caveat before we move on to the uh, general staff department. Cyber, cyber capabilities are a nascent capacity for all militaries, let alone the North Korean one. Um, it's very possible in the future that due to either a refining of operational concepts um, or discovery of more efficient usage that we see restructuring within these organizations, uh, similar to the restructuring we've seen fairly recently. Um, as well, the leadership is going through a particularly bad bout of purging uh, and leadership transition. So what seemingly arbitrary political activities could have an effect on uh, future organizational charts. That being said, we'll move on to the general staff of the Korean People's Army. This is meant to be an overwhelming chart and is just to show that the, the general staff department, while we are using it as the overarching uh, reference point for North Korea's military cyber capabilities, it is a very large reaching organization that governs the entirety of the Korean People's Army. It's comparable to a Soviet style general staff uh, within any Soviet or even Prussian uh, inspired military. These are the folks in charge of war planning, defensive planning um, during peacetime and just preparing for the wartime environment. Um, we felt that looking at their organizational structure, as far as one can figure out the Korean People's Army's detailed organizational structure, um, is very helpful for trying to uh, figure out how they may manage a conflict in the future, though this is imperfect. Um, the GSD is responsible for cyber capabilities. These are in the previous chart, but they're a small portion. Um, the cyber elements are a very small portion of the General Staff Department's uh, responsibilities. They're responsible for all of the infantry, artillery, everything conventional, in addition to these. Um, so we've tried to condense this into their main cyber capabilities. And they have a few units that have been identified. Um, the blue units are those that are tangentially uh, 
uh, related or, un or, or have some sort of coordinating mission or historical relationship with the cyber elements, but these two blue, the Communications Bureau and Electronic Warfare Bureau, do not conduct cyber operations on their own. Um, this TAN unit, the inelegantly translated in English Enemy Collapse Sabotage Bureau, uh, is known in South, is reported repeatedly in South Korean media as, quote, waging cyber warfare against South Korea. Um, we include this only because we believe this is false. Um, we believe they do, based on our research, they do seem to conduct psychological and propaganda operations, and they do so through the internet. Uh, however, evidence of additional uh, disruptive cyber operations is absent uh, as of now. However, the final two organizations uh, are more directly associated with conducting cyber operations, and these are the Operations Bureau and the Command Automation Bureau, uh, and it's, two sub it's three identified subunits. The Operations Bureau is another general use bureau. It is in charge of planning and, in some cases, conducting operations within the Korean People's Army. This means that they would probably ha have a hand in the planning, execution, um, or perhaps coordination of cyber operations, disruptive cyber operations. However, they themselves do not wage it. Um, we also do not know the extent to which they actually perform this mission because the, the KPA is one of the most singularly opaque militaries in the world. Um, and we have very few details on the actual inner workings of the operations department. Uh, this can also be said for the Command Automation Bureau. This is another bureau that South Korean media occasionally reports as, quote, waging cyber warfare against South Korea. Uh, we believe this is probably generally a result of confusion with the Reconnaissance General Bureau's missions. Um, the Command Automation Bureau may be in charge of networking the DPRK's forces to whatever extent they are networked. Um, their exact mission is highly opaque as well. Um, however, one of the important takeaways for the General Staff Department is, even though the KPA and its military units are frequently reported as conducting disruptive cyber operations against usually South Korea, uh, we have no evidence to say that the General Staff Department's uh, command authority, uh, we have no evidence to say that any of the cyber elements of the GSD actually wage disruptive cyber, actually conduct disruptive cyber operations, or as the media would say, wage cyber war. Um, we believe that they may have more of a mission towards supporting conventional operations and preparing in a wartime environment to disrupt, uh, in the similar sense that electronic warfare forces prepare to disrupt uh, and jam and create problems for opposing forces during a war. We believe that they may have a similar mission to that. Um, our evidence, our, our investigations show that the RGB is probably the dominant peacetime uh, cyber operator, if you will. Um, however, and this may show that the leadership conceptualizes at a strategic level cyber capabilities as a means of peacetime coercion and peacetime influence, as opposed to focusing entirely on their military capabilities, purely conventional military capabilities. Um, one very large caveat to this is that the General Staff Department, if it was waging cyber warfare, would have great incentive to be targeting sensitive military targets, and as such, there may be an absence of data in the open source by nature of what their targets would be. Uh, so based on the open source data we have, it appears that the RGB is the predominant organization favored for cyber operations right now. Uh, however, someone with a security clearance and access to proper information could possibly disprove that. Um, uh, as well, the Korean People's Army uh, has, uh, for the little bit of doctrine and strategy that does get published and brought into English and into South Korea, uh, the Korean People's Army has a large focus on combined arms and joint operations, that is, using multiple types of military units together uh, at tactical and operational levels for greater strategic effect. Uh, this is, and there have also been quotes that have come out from various members of the leadership and military that emphasize the importance of asymmetric high-tech capabilities, such as electronic warfare, um, and that integrating high-tech capabilities that are capable of asymmetrically upsetting and staggering a high-tech foe uh, would be vital capabilities for the KPA to acquire and integrate with their conventional forces. As such, we believe that this logic 
extends to cyber operations, and we believe that disruptive cyber operations would be a, a, uh, a very much desired cap capacity for the Korean People's Army conventional forces, and so we expect to see some degree of integration with their conventional forces in the future. Um, we don't know exactly what form this would take, and we'll talk about this a little in the policy section, uh, but we do expect that there would be further integration with their, Korean, their military forces, and the defense planners would have to take that into account. It's also very difficult to do, uh, so it may take a very long time to be an effective integration. So after looking at the strategic context and the people who act within that strategic context, we've tried to build several future trends, uh, things that we think based on what's happened will happen in the future, uh, and a series of policy recommendations for how to properly respond to these trends. Um, the first two trends are fairly simple and are mainly predicated on the idea that there's, there's no real reason for North Korea to reduce its cyber operations. Uh, they still maintain a very low operational risk. Uh, they provide a means of exerting influence efficiently against South Korea and the United States. And they're useful for currency generation. As such, uh, we believe they'll continue at either the current frequency or an increased frequency. There's a spectrum of expectation for whether or not these will be low intensity or high intensity. Uh, that being low intensity attacks being, while well called low intensity, things comparable to the March 2013 Dark Soul attacks, the Sony Pictures Entertainment attacks. Attacks that may cause millions of dollars worth of damage in the civilian sectors, but never approach the threshold for a use of force or an act of war. So they're unambiguously not war. It's sort of like these low-level provocations we've seen for years. Um, and we believe that's, that's probably where they'll stay because this gives them the most operational freedom. It allows the North Koreans to dictate at the intensity of their attacks. It allows them to continue operating uh, and by not being intense can try to undermine future responses uh, and make it harder to respond because they're just small harassments costing millions of dollars each time. However, uh, anyone familiar with Korean Peninsular politics will know that, you, that crises happen and escalations have happened from almost every kind of provocation. And as such, a, an, a either spike or continued campaign of high intensity should be, expect, should be prepared for, perhaps not expected, but should be prepared for in the future. Um, after all, North Korea and South Korea are, are want to escalate sometimes. These have gotten out of control, and it could either be because North Korea feels emboldened because of victory or success at a lower intensity, uh, agitated at some political issue, uh, or realistically miscalculation and a misunderstanding or a misperception of where they are and what their attack will do uh, in regards to South Korea. Uh, the accident one is probably the scariest because it could be the most likely on that, but we still expect the lower intensity to be the general tenor for the future. Um, also, as I stated earlier, that we expect the General Staff Department to continue integrating its units so that it has a, a perhaps not a high-tech network-centric military as the U.S. has, but, but you may see a higher-tech KPA that is perhaps anti-networked or developed in a way, that's not a phrase, I know, um, developed in a way that aims to demultiply US forces. We always refer to network-centric uh, warfare as a force multiplier and an ability to gain more bang for your buck. Uh, and North Korea has great incentive. Even if they can't necessarily disrupt it, they have great incentive to try. Uh, because that may be the, one of the ways the KPA has any chance of lasting uh, in any sort of actual escalated or wartime scenario. Uh, for this, we've, provide, we've uh, identified four basic policy objectives that the U.S. and the U.S. ROC Alliance should have different ways of, of identifying and pursuing. Um, and this is preparing a graduated series of direct responses, uh, directly targeting North Korea's capabilities so that you're not caught off guard, you know how to respond to different levels of the escalation ladder, ladder with different directed responses so that you're not left purely with just policy and just talk. Uh, curb North Korea's operational freedom in uh, cyberspace. The phrase information high ground or high ground in cyberspace sometimes gets used. Uh, and this would be an example of North Korea to some degree having that. They have a lot of freedom in when to, when to do these attacks, 
Uh, there's a lot of allegations of third-party states hosting them. We'll get into that slightly. But basically, make it so North Korea doesn't have the ability to dictate the time and place and intensity of their attacks. Uh, identify and leverage North Korea's vulnerabilities in the same way that the US and ROK have particular vulnerabilities due to our network dependence. North Korea has shown great sensitivity to information flow. Um, and in particular, has recently shown a very uh, great sensitivity to regime reputation, especially that of the Kim family. We saw with the incredibly agitating loudspeaker broadcasts recently that that had a surprisingly significant effect on KPA at Panmunjom. Um, and this could be something to look into pursuing, um, as well as adopting damage mitigation and resiliency measures. Uh, we're at the point where we would expect if a high enough intensity operation was conducted, something will get through, and you, you must be prepared to basically absorb that or deal with it. All right, so I'll briefly touch on um, recommendations for US uh, very brief briefly. Um, so after Sony, uh, one of the the biggest policy questions was figuring out what would be a proportional response for a cyber attack that quite doesn't rise to the level of use of force or uh, an armed attack, but still resulting in some sort of economic and physical damage. Um, and the incident sort of reminded us that it's not only necessary to establish declaratory policy against highly damaging cyber attacks, such as those against critical infrastructure, but also important to review a uh, policy for a range of cyber attacks that fall below that threshold. Um, and with the two executive orders passed earlier this year, uh, US, we believe, has prepared the grounds for such a policy against North Korea's cyber operations. But we really need to examine more closely on how these executive orders uh, can be leveraged so that these policies can actually have an impact and shape North Korea's decision-making procedures. And one of the first things we can do is to uh, start implementing some of these orders by actually um, naming more names um, and going after individuals and entities uh, within the RGB or within the larger DPRK's uh, government uh, that are directly engaged in or materially supporting uh, North Korea cyber operations. Um, and without the help of third party states, it may not go beyond you know, sending a message, uh, but we believe that merely revealing relevant information regarding their operations may help limit their operational freedom. Uh, additionally, uh, these policies, especially you know, sanctions implementations, uh, would be more effective if there was international support. For example, a uh, stronger international consensus on and practical application of uh, concepts such as the norms of state responsibility in cyberspace would create a situation where uh, the U.S. can better pressure countries uh, that knowingly harbor North Korean cyber operations uh, in their jurisdiction. Um, going briefly into recommendations for the alliance. Uh, for the alliance, the priority seems to be in developing a sort of a gradient of response options uh, depending on uh, the various ranges of contingency scenarios uh, on the Korean Peninsula that's related to cyber operations. And the important thing to note is that these scenarios shouldn't just be limited to figuring out how to respond to a cyber operation or a cyber attack, but also consider uh, the possibility that um, cyber, cyber means could be integrated to DPRK's uh, larger military and something like Yongpyeong Island where uh, cyber means could be used um, in a in a low intensity operation where they can be used to disrupt um, and enhance their own firepower. Um, and so a very variety of contingency scenarios could be, should be reviewed and planned for. Um, and the existing uh, US and ROK cyber cooperation working group should be a good venue to continue such a discussion. I already spoke about the loudspeakers earlier, so we'll just remind that North Korea has a vulnerability to this outside information. Uh, US Rock Alliance should perhaps look into that as a means of uh, establishing a sort of balance or deterrent, uh, something that they, you can hold, something you can hold essentially. Um, for, uh, as well, it need to look into actively mitigating the vulnerabilities inherent in any alliance structure. Uh, there are a lot of targets for cyber operations within the United States' um, hub and spokes alliance. There's a lot of high tech solutions that require precision data uh, and a lot of technologies that are becoming increasingly important, such as ballistic missile defense shields uh, and air early warning systems. 
uh, that require precision data, quick decision cycles, uh, and cyber operations waged against these reduces the uh, efficiency and any, any introduction of inefficiencies into these systems leads to an overall reduction uh, in effectiveness of responses. Uh, the U.S. Alliance system, the U.S. Alliance uh, members need to be training together and preparing for these sorts of situations, and not only preparing to defend from this sort of uh, operation, but also prepare to uh, work in a degraded environment should defense prove untenable. Uh, we should note we are not fear mongers, and this is not a place the DPRK is at yet. We don't expect the DPRK to be knocking out ballistic missile defense shield technologies or shutting down all of the radar networks. Um, however, it's something that, that needs to be looked into, and the Alliance needs to be prepared to defend th from that threat should it ever actually arise. Um, we know that this is something they'd probably be interested in looking for, so the, so the Alliance needs to be interested in looking for a way to defeat that. Great, and um, brief finally, um, greater information sharing is, is important uh, for the Alliance because it allows defenders to not only um, have a better idea about uh, North Korea's attack methods, and sometimes it even allows them to stop or mitigate against uh, such an attack before it actually happens at the exploitation phase. Um, also, you know, strong information sharing mechanisms uh, also has an ad added benefit of forcing North Korea to develop new tactics, techniques, and procedures more frequently so that um, it has the effect of raising the cost of conducting an operation. Also, uh, the U.S. and ROK should continue with their existing efforts uh, for cyber capacity building and confidence building measures within the Asia Pacific, uh, because these are actually really critical in helping other countries in the region have an internal capacity to mitigate malicious cyber activity coming out of their territory, and also uh, CBMs help uh, reduce the chances of miscalculation and escalation during a conflict where third party states are involved. So I guess that uh, brings us to the conclusion. <laughs> so our basically three, three basic points are that cyber operations are not, you know, isolated incidents um, that, you know, DPRK pulled off just because they were pissed off at the interview. But these are actually a natural progression of DPRK's nat uh, <coughs> national strategy and that you can see is sort of a trend uh, going as early as 2009 and as, you know, recently as, um, late of last year. Um, and when we look at how cyber operations are organized and how they have been raised in importance uh, over the past few years, they're unlikely to be abandoned by the regime in the near future. And also, based on these two conclusions, US and ROK should work on both uh, defensive solutions as well as proactive solutions to continue to pressure North Koreans' uh, cyber operations and their operational freedom you know, that they have right now. Additionally, there are a few av avenues we've identified that uh, should necessitate further research. As mentioned earlier, uh, general espionage and crime were outside of the scope of this, which focused on disruptive cyber operations. Um, our research showed that criminal activity is actually fairly important within the Reconnaissance General Bureau uh, and would be worthy of its own report, probably, is definitely something that should be further researched. Um, additionally, primary source documents are important whenever we can get them. This is a field where primary sources are very hard to come by and very appreciated when they're received. Um, whether this is something brought in from North Korea or something declassified to give us a slightly better idea of where the government or intelligence communities are. Uh, as well, contributions from the technical community are always appreciated. While this is a strategic look, um, it's important to have a strong uh, technical bottom-up look as well to create a full picture of what's actually occurring. Um, and academic dialogues, whether they're within the U.S., ROK, and between the two, are always valuable means of producing additional insights and research. Oh, thank you. Uh, hmm. So I think we're looking at uh, two trends here that the report highlights uh, particularly well. Um, one is the increased uh, integration of cyber activities, activities, pardon me, into military operations. And so it's, it will be inconceivable within, it's inconceivable now that an advanced military will not have some kind of cyber capability 
it will be integrated with electronic warfare. It has a, a, a kinetic effect or a potential for something that resembles a kinetic effect that we've all talked about and tend to focus on, but the, the, uh, the emphasis will be, as the report probably indicates, uh, indicates probably focused on um, disrupting command and control, interfering with uh, weapon systems, and with sensors, right? So this is part of warfare now, and the image I use sometimes is, if you remember uh, Lawrence of Arabia, there's a scene at the beginning where the uh, Turks are bombing uh, the Arabs' camp, and you have Faisal riding back and forth on his horse, chasing them with his sword, right? That's what it's gonna be like if you don't have cyber capabilities, you know, so enjoy the ride. Um, the second trend, and this one is a little more difficult, is that in the, in the last, uh, say, eight or nine years, we have seen um, countries, particularly North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China, um, explore the use of cyber operations for coercive effect. And this is, again, one of the central themes of the report. And so we need to think about that. Um, it's interesting, the Russians are probably the ones who came up with this. Estonia is the first big, big public example. And the world has changed, so what we wanna ask about is, how is the environment for coercive cyber action changing? And I think we'd wanna look at a couple things here. Uh, the first is changes in the ability to attribute. So the chart at the beginning, the 2009 attacks, um, there was still a great deal of uncertainty. At the time, no one knew who was responsible. Everyone suspected North Korea. But if you compare that to the Estonia attacks, where we had very precise knowledge that North Korea was responsible, the improvements in attributions reshapes the environment for coercive action. Um, the second thing I think, as, as both Jenny and Scott mentioned, is the idea of a proportional response. There's still a fair amount of confusion over proportional response, but as countries experiment with how to use this new tool, they are um, beginning to define the parameters of proportional response, right? And so we'll see a period here where um, 2009, disruptive action, no idea who did it, and really no response, right? Limited effect, but no response. That will not be the case in the future. And one of the things that I think is interesting out of the action since Sony, and Sony was a seminal event, is that um, the response, a proportional response, uh, won't be combined, confined to a cyber response. And so this doesn't necessarily mean a military response or a kinetic response. It could include sanctions, indictments, other diplomatic actions. But I think the thing to look forward in the future is how the use of cyber techniques for coercive uh, activities will change. And the question, I know Victor has thought a lot about this, and they all have, is North Korea gonna miscalculate on this, right? It will be riskier to do this kind of thing in the future. Um, will they figure that out? Uh, it'd be interesting to get others' view on that. On the integration into military capabilities, it's almost certain they'll do it to the best of their ability, but the temptation of coercive action, I think, will remain strong. And people don't generally realize how much the environment has changed. If you, if you, but a good way to think about it is to compare 2009 to 2014 and uh, the Sony events. So why don't I stop there?
Uh, Brent Young, SRA International. Uh, Scott, I liked anti-network very much. I recommend sticking with that. So uh, this is a great event. I'm looking forward to reading the paper. Uh, there are very few events like this in Think Tank. Um, one of the last ones uh, that, was, that I was familiar with was in December uh, at Korea Economic Institute. And uh, Dr. Mansurov spoke at that event. Uh, and one of the things that he talked about there was, um, uh, and Scott, you touched upon this also, was uh, DPRK cyber operators who operate out of China. And this is obviously going to affect your policy recommendations. So my question is twofold. Uh, the first is, uh, does your research uh, corroborate this? And second, what sort of policy recommendations would you make if it does? Thank you. Ginny will cover the policy recommendations and I'll, I'll answer. Uh, does our research corroborate this? Uh, so I'm going to answer that in two parts. The research corroborates that there are North Korean cyber, uh, some people call them operational bases. That's a really ex probably extreme term for what's there. Uh, outside of country, which is not the same as being in China, though. Uh, Cambodia is the one that they have arrested people in uh, twice now, once now, uh, at least once. Um, it's typically people who are setting up illicit gambling websites uh, or other sort of websites uh, aimed at currency generation and malware injection sometime. Uh, we have not found credible evidence uh, other than rumors and speculations of cooperation, uh, knowing or unknowing, by China. Um, so. Yes to there's some outside of country, uh, no to being able to verify anything on Chinese soil. So I guess a lot of this also would depend on people with other sources of information other than open source and, <coughs> you know, technical information, classified information, other things. For those of you who are in that arena, you know, if, if there is such an evidence, and if there is an evidence, you want to look at how you can respond in a, from a policy perspective. I think as we said in the policy recommendation section, one of the things is, you know, the norm that states should have a responsibility over malicious cyber activity coming out of their territory, regardless of whether it's proxy actors, whether it's their own government actors, whether it's, you know, third party country people, you know, that, that norm has been, it's, it's nascent, it's been agreed at the 2013 UNGG and also affirmed at the 2015 UNGG, but whether that's universally accepted and whether that's, you know, a thing that every state, you know, domestically sort of internalized, that's really still nascent. But, you know, as, as more countries, you know, debate around this idea and, uh, you know, elect to adopt this norm, that could become a basis for pressuring whichever country that decides to knowingly harbor these operations. And it'll be sort of a diplomatic pressure mechanism. Maybe a question for the three, and then I want to say something about China. Is uh, My assumption has been that a lot of the external North Korean activity would parallel their criminal networks. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about where they operate criminal activity, that might be where they would look at operating some of the cyber activities. Um, there have been two discussions with senior Chinese officials on uh, one specifically on the Sony incident and one in particular on uh, North Korean cyber activities. Uh, in the first one, the Chinese basically expressed uh, exasperation with their pet and the difficulty in controlling it. I'm sure that we've heard that and other scenarios as well. In the second one, it was a little more interesting, <clears throat> and it was a scene, more senior level Chinese group where they basically said, um, it's not worth the cost to us of disrupting our relationship. They didn't put it in these words. It's not worth the cost of disrupting our relationship with North Korea to help you out on these things, right? And so we, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the balance of things and it's not worth it right, for us. So I think that's interesting, and it indicates for me a little bit of a hardening in the Chinese position. These discussions took place probably over about two years. Uh, but the last time we talked to them, they said, oh, you're only bringing this up to disrupt relations between China and North Korea, to, to which we, of course, responded, you know, why would we bother? The North Koreans will do that for us.
Thank you very much, um, Paul Joyle from NSI. And thank you for the work that you have done on this. Um, I'd like to um, redirect the, um, most of your discussion today is, uh, is more on the, I would say the military kinetic aspects of, of, of how cyber can support a military operation. But um, you did point out uh, concerning the um, uh, Enemy Collapse and Sabotage Bureau. Um, I think this raises an interesting point because cyber operations, as we've seen in the Russia case in Estonia that has been mentioned also in Georgia, um, can be used for powerful psychological warfare effects, can be used for, uh, as, as a precursor and as an indicator of military operations. Um, you also mentioned their sensitivity about the propaganda and the, uh, the issues related to the, the speakers uh, at the DMZ. Um, may I suggest that, um, that the area of the use of cyber operations for this type of unconventional warfare and influence operations is an integral part of a military uh, uh, campaign. It's just not looking at silencing radars and, and, and degrading uh, communication systems, especially when it comes to an ideological regime that requires uh, a very strict ideological line within their own population to mobilize that population for any particular uh, military steps. Um, could you maybe comment on this? Do you plan to maybe focus on this a little more and was there anything that, you've, uh, that you have detected in the open literature that indicates an appreciation of information warfare in the broadest sense of the term in which cyber is an uh, integral and important component? Uh, yes, this report did focus on disruptive operations, but that's correct. Uh, information warfare is a very important part of cyber operations. Uh, we've seen them referred to in North Korea uh, as, as uh, cyber psychological operations occasionally um, as a means of differentiating them from pure espionage, criminal activity, disruptive activity. Uh, some uh, English language sources, I think Joe Bermudez refers to it as electronic information, it refers to cyber as a whole in the North Korean case as uh, electronic information warfare. Uh, there's a very important aspect to that. Um, you're correct. Uh, I th if I remember correctly, the lineage generally goes, uh, Soviet Union started with uh, agitprop departments that would work even with low-level military operations. Uh, Maoist guerrillas would do the same thing. There's a very large lineage, especially within communist bloc countries, uh, for waging intensive information propaganda and political warfare with conventional operations, down to having political warfare units, not just political officers, which we expect in uh, an ideological military. Uh, but actual ideological political units uh, with its, both its conventional military and in North Korea's case, it's going to also be with its asymmetric peacetime operations. Uh, that's correct um, and is, is, is supported in the open source literature, we believe, um, but it's just a little bit outside of scope of what we were focusing on, which was purely disruption. Um, that, like criminal activities, uh, is probably worth, worthy of a lot of additional research, though, and there's definitely a, a theory of cyber psychological warfare, if you will, that's being enacted um, by Russia, by China. There's a lot of allegations against China for that as well, and the DPRK um, for changing sort of a narrative warfare that goes on. I'm really glad you brought that up because um, as, as we looked at how these um, activities were organized within the North Korean government, if you remember um, looking at the GSD chart, we saw things such as, you know, command automation, you know, communications bureau, electronic warfare bureau, and also, you know, the, the propaganda bureau. And all of these elements seem to suggest that North Korea, like, you know, the Russians or the Chinese or other countries that are not the U.S., think about cyber as part of a larger sort of an information warfare strategy. And these are the separate elements, basically different means of how you affect you know, information during a conflict. And so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And we actually, in our private discussions, talked a lot about how this, how they're organized looks very different from how the US organizes their, their cyber.
It's worth noting that <clears throat> uh, the uh, Center for Cyber Defense in uh, Tallinn, uh, which is uh, affiliated with NATO, uh, will be coming out with a, a book on this in um, a month or two, where they look at uh, particularly at Ukraine and the use of cyber techniques in the Ukraine. And there are three examples. All of them are Russian, Estonia, Georgia, and Ukraine. Um, one of the things I think you've heard is that countries that have a Leninist background seem to have an affection for this kind of activity. It's, it's cute. Um, but they may, also, they may also overvalue it. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in the NATO book, and NATO has spent a lot of time thinking about this, is assess how effective it is. Is it a precursor? It's almost certainly a precursor to something. And you know, how does it change? How does the effect change over time? So uh, something to look forward to probably about in uh, uh, October. Hi, uh, Joe Marks for Politico and a Georgetown grad. Um, two questions. Uh, I'm hoping you can expand on the Sony hack a little bit from two directions. One is um, you've talked about you know trying to keep things beneath the level of an armed attack. This was certainly beneath the level of an armed attack, but it did prompt um, a U.S. response in the form of more sanctions, not a response that had an effect on the ground, but you know probably the most significant response to a cyber attack from the U.S. yet. So is the lesson inside North Korea more or less in response to Sony? And then secondly, from the direction of attribution, there was this definitive attribution out of the U.S. government in this case, but as I think Scott pointed out earlier, we're not saying how we got there because we don't want to reveal sources and methods. So does that prompt more or less from North Korea? Just to clarify, do you mean more or less like future cyber operations like emboldenment? Can you just clarify a little? Yeah, emboldenment, higher, higher intensity attacks. <laughs> it would probably depend on, depend on the long-term effectiveness of the sanctions. Um, it, the two executive orders did establish a means of the, for the U.S. to go after specific people, um, but it has not yet, to my knowledge, uh, done the whole naming name things where it brings out a list of comprehensive cited people. Uh, so we may not yet be at the point where it either emboldened or dampened their enthusiasm for this type of thing. Um, it also may be too soon to, to tell, honestly. Sanctions are not a quick process, usually. Uh, and North Korea has been sanctioned so much that the change of these particular ones may take a little bit of time to, to see if they had any effect. Um, there may be new sanctions introduced in the future to further detail and find the act, like hit the actual streams of revenue uh, or identify the people. Um, so I would give you an unfortunate, I'm not quite sure, because we're not on the ground. And it's, that's difficult to figure out, honestly. If you, you want to watch the um, <clears throat> upcoming uh, circus with China, uh, and if the uh, uh, if indeed sanctions are imposed on both Chinese and Russian uh, individuals, that will be a further reinforcement of the idea that seems to be percolating out among our foreign friends that the U.S. has unique attribution capabilities and is now willing to respond. So we're in a very dynamic environment, and this will look very different six months from now. Just to touch a little bit on your second question on attribution, um, I don't have a whole lot to say, but one of the important, sort of the interesting things I saw after Sony was how fast the U.S. government uh, was in being able to attribute or say that they have attributed this attack. Um, and I 
I'm not sure if that's the real case in the case of Sony, but one of the conceptual things uh, that came to mind was that not all, not all attribution is the same. So some actors might be harder to attribute things because they're better at hiding their tracks and they care about their operational security and so on and so forth. Whereas, you know, for you know, a country like North Korea, they may not spend too much time on operational security or, you know, because, you know, there isn't much to track, it's maybe easier to track. And conceptually, one of the things is that if it's, if they're relying on a myth that attribution is difficult and if there's a way to sort of, if that has been any way debunked after the Sony incident, that could have an impact on how they're planning a future operation. Um, hi, first, uh, uh, Patton Adams with um, VR Sign Eye Defense, also a Georgetown graduate. Um, thank you for the, yeah, yeah, let's get it out of the way. Um, th thank you for your research and I look forward to the paper. Um, a lot of cyber threat intelligence analysis shops, both within government, military, and private sector, um, associate state-sponsored cyber activity with cyber espionage. Um, especially in the case of North Korea, is this a mistake or is this maybe something that analysts should think twice about? Um, I've heard a few mentions of kind of the the way a DPRK cyber activity follows criminal activity. The engineers that were disguised, uh, that sold gambling malware and things like that, the, the Cambodian uh, arrests. Um, can cyber crime activity maybe be seen in the DPRK context of cyber activity as a, um, a preparatory phase or um, maybe a, a part of a hybrid of uh, human operations and cyber operations that uh, would enable uh, other disruptive or coercive cyber activity? Yeah, so as we said earlier, and I, I don't know which slide, but probably one of the RGB slides, is that um, we've seen at least in one instance that was reported in open source that it, I think, yeah, 2012 when um, RGB agents were disguised as software engineers and they were, you know, spreading illegal gambling, you know, selling illegal gambling software. And one of the interesting thing was that that software also had a malware component in it, and that allowed them to, I think it was um, allowing them to build botnets or something like that. So it, it has a dual purpose, and there, it's not to say that all cyber criminal activity coming out of North Korea has a dual purpose, but that was at least one case where, where that was you know, the case. Um, and I guess for most of this, I guess, cyber intelligence, um, at least the private sector that's focusing on this, focus a lot on espionage because that's the predominant sort of cyber activity that's targeting the private sector right now. But I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, in the future we see more of these disruptive cyber operations that are for coercive actions um, also targeted against the private sector. But that's, uh, in my opinion, an emerging trend, and maybe that's why a lot of the work has been focused on espionage. Hi, yes, Tim Olson with IHS. Um, thank you for the presentation. My question is, I, I know your report focused more on the offensive capabilities, um, but uh, does North Korea have any uh, uh, defensive cyber capabilities? And um, I'm, I'm not really sure, but <laughs> do they plan to develop them? If they don't, have they changed at all in, in the recent past? Thank you. So this is, to say the least, a very opaque, uh, specific sub, I guess, unit of our research. Um, theoretically, yes, they should. Um, and with integration with the KPA, that's, that should be part of it. Um, however, unless there's anything uh, you'd like to add on, I am unaware of any actual evidence of such, th nothing that came across my desk, at least. Um, I, I, have, I, I would know very little details about it. Um, so I would go with theoretically, yes. But theoretically, yes. <laughs> the old joke used to be, of course, and this was a problem in the proportional response debate to Sony, is 
you know, so suppose you turned out the lights in North Korea, how could they tell? Right? <laughs> um, you know, there's 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 the the limitations of the economy make defense a less pressing problem for them and gives them a little bit of an advantage in this. There is a phenomenon, um, and and sometimes this gets linked. Uh, probably very unfairly with the United States, that every year or so, the North Korean internet just kind of goes down um, in regards to connecting with the rest of the world. Um, and for states that have tightly controlled uh, firewalls and server networks, that could be part of an upgrade, that could be part of maintenance, could be part of a malicious cyber activity. Um, but if that's a benign, if that's a regular domestic occurrence also, that would make it much more difficult to tell if like try to try to figure out via evidence presented to us um, whether or not they'd been taken down because their defenses were breached or whether or not it was just that time of the year when they need to edit their configuration files so they turn the internet off again. Um, it's, it's kind of a mysterious phenomenon and some people have some explanations for it but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theorizing around what it actually means. Hi. Hi, I'm Jen Whedon from FireEye, and I actually went to Fletcher, so. <laughs> um, but I, just on the cyber espionage front, and a shout out to my colleague who's here in the back who just wrote a blog on this, but we have seen in terms of um, technical sort of tools, malware, and infrastructure overlap between the traditional cyber espionage operations to steal data as well as some of these more destructive attacks. So there's some sort of sharing, collaboration going on there. And then secondly, you know, you mentioned, you sort of threw out the whole strengthening legal regimes and, um, and, and, and international norms around this activity, and I was just wondering if you could speak, maybe I'm just too uh, negative on that aspect these days, but if you could talk practically about how the North Koreans would abide by that and, and given how they generally operate in the international arena. Um. I think most of these norms and sort of legal regime, international legal regimes are, you know, I guess the expectation that North Korea would, you know, abide by these as a lawful, I don't know, a, a responsible actor in the international system is pretty bleak. Um, but most of these are aimed at, I guess, third party states that continue to harbor these, or uh, if they are harboring, continue to harbor these operations. Um, and so the goal would be to sort of decrease the footprint of North Korea's cyber operations and that way apply pressure to them, not necessarily using these norms and legal regimes to directly target North Korea. Just a bit about the sharing, I'm glad you brought this up, is just to reiterate, um, the Reconnaissance General Bureau especially, as we said, is a one-stop shop. Uh, as we also said, our main scope was disruption, but they, they are, uh, associated with being sort of the root of all outside irregular problems with North Korea. They have a lot of criminal activity, both cyber and non-cyber. Uh, they and their predecessor organizations um, have been associated with numerous incidents um, ranging from criminal activity, espionage, um, violent provocations, uh, the, the two assassination attempts, the two main assassination attempts we're familiar with for South Korean presidents were both uh, pre from the, allegedly from the predecessor organizations of the RGB. Um, they do a little bit of everything, um, and we believe to some degree those may be f somewhat mutually supporting. Um, that goes into sort of more theory than exact data on those. There's no, a lot of their things could be organized in a way where they are mutually supporting um, so that bases could be used for any number of things and could be running cyber operations and you know human operations, other things. Um, but that goes into theory based on what their strategic goals are and how we've seen uh, them act in the past, but they do a little of all of it. So it's intertwined very heavily and, and sometimes very difficult to parse apart actually.
and until recently, the um, thinking on the development of norms was very much based on the proliferation model. There have been a couple instances where the U.S. has been able to go to other countries and ask for their assistance in um, curtailing the actions of a third party like North Korea. So this has worked, and the development of norms is a positive step. Even the Russians and the Chinese have, in theory, agreed to take action against third parties. You know, the Chinese specifically, in this case, and the Russians in general. Now, whether they'd actually do it is another matter, but the basis for action against these uh, cooperation with third parties, even non-cooperative third parties, non-friendly third parties, would, is, is being laid. Bobby Bestron, Ruth Mott Foundation. Um, is it the centralization of these cyber capacities within a particular part of the North Korean government that actually makes it categorically different than the cyber capacities that are being developed by other nation states, including the U.S.? And I want to set aside the range of criminal um, and perhaps even um, commercial um, cyber activity that may be underway in other nation states as well? Um, no, uh, I think the answer is no. Uh, the North Korean model is interesting, and this is a good part of the report, is that the people who are closest to it are actually the Russians. So the, the, Rus the way the Russians do this seems to be very close to the way the North Koreans do it. I don't, my guess is, and you guys would know better than me, that's just because they're coming out of s similar organizational and military doctrine, not because of actual cooperation. I, I didn't see that. But um, other countries are, are centralizing this, trying to figure out how to integrate it with their military forces, and trying to define the line between uh, espionage activity and military activity. And there, there, there's some, um, a lot of parallels with people confronting this new tool, how do we make it useful? The bigger issue, which I thought was an interesting part of the report, is how do I integrate it with EW capabilities? And so that's a challenge, even for the US, is how do I fit, fit this in? But centralization by itself is the norm. I mean, you know, everybody had all these disparate bits floating around and figured out, geez, maybe I should bring them together, I'd be more effective. I think one of the also the interesting things that may make it slightly unique um, or slightly different from other countries is specifically the centralization of cyber capabilities in the same house as maritime insertion and commando capabilities. Um, because while everyone does pursue centralization, they're not always uh, teaming up their cyber guys with the same ones who are perhaps associated with kidnappings. Um, and other sorts of irregular operations that have been conducted over the years. Um, so the centralization itself, I would agree, no. But the centralization with other things that it can't fully ever be divorced from, um, unless empirical evidence shows up that somehow they've figured out how to do that. Uh, that's why we did the organizational analyses, um, to look at these are the kinds of guys uh, that are their office mates. Um, and this is the kind of expertise they're going to be surrounded by. Um, and so we think that means something. It has an interesting implication for how they're conceptualizing it how they're, and how they're using it for the future. Thanks. Uh, Frank Chinuzzi with the Mansfield Foundation. Uh, excellent uh, report. I'm really looking forward to reading the, the larger piece. Um, the last question feeds into mine, which is uh, you talk about, Scott, the, the uh, office mates, um, but it seems to me that the um, cyber folks are likely to come from a different background than some of the people that they're sharing the office with. And my que first question is, is that true? In other words, where is the human capital coming from for cyber in North Korea as opposed to other kinds of special ops and, and, and reconnaissance bureau disruptive activities? and and. Um, do we know much about how they're developing that human capital, including education abroad in China or other places? Because um, it's the first question I often get from colleagues when they say, well, do you think North Korea did this by themselves? I mean, how did they learn how to do this? And I, I'm, I'm always quick to 
remind people that North Koreans are smart and capable and do a lot of things on their own. But uh, and then the second part of the question is just if they if they have that human capital and it's being concentrated here under the the government and the Re reconnaissance general bureau, are there um, private, if you will, uh, rogue elements that might also be operating uh, in North Korea comparable to what happens in China, where you have an army of, of young teenage boys you know, who, who like hacking into the Pentagon just because they think it's a, it's a fun challenge. But you also have you know, the, the government-sponsored uh, PLA you know, directed cyber activities. But I, I think in China, you've got both. But in North Korea, is it, is it all encompassed here pretty much under RGB? We have seen no indication of any sort of like rogue or splintering. That's uh, that would be more possible for f uh, folks that are stationed outside the country for sure. Um, but we've seen no indication of that. Uh, there are rumors, of course, always of that because that's something that theoretically is possible and to some degree maybe logical. If you have these skills, why not use them for your own benefit? But we have no evidence on that. Um, human capital. We spent a lot of time trying to track. Um, there's a lot of evidence on which specific colleges feed into the military, then which high schools feed into the colleges, which middle schools feed into the high schools. Um, there's also a lot of contradictory information on what the names of any of those institutions are, um, the numbers produced. It ends up being a very, very tangled web. Um, some of, and some of these organizations uh, suffer from misattribution in the open source, where perhaps one university that's being referred to may be actually a different university, um, and sort of a media narrative feeds into that. And so it's been very difficult to track that. And I don't have, Ginny may have a more solid answer, because mine's just going to be, it's, it's really difficult. We have sort of in private conversations an idea for it, but it's not really a solid enough um, statement that I, I, I could really go out on a limb for it. Um, but they probably are not going to be the same stock that you're pulling your commandos from within the RGB. Um, in this fictional office where they are sharing desk with their friends, uh, because for the record, this is not literal. They have many offices. Um, it's going to be different um, folks. You're going to take you know, people who are specially trained for certain things. And they, they do have different um, bureaus. Uh, this, a lot of this map, the blue bits, comes specifically from uh, Joseph Bermudez has done a lot of analysis into what the Reconnaissance General Bureau's specific makeup is and um, to some degree what sorts of people may be brought in in each different organization. Um, and I, I, I think much like in uh, any other cyber organization, it's probably hard to transfer laterally from a non-technical field into that. So this is another one where we suffer from sort of theorizing. Um, they're probably a specific academic and intellectual stock that's, that's looked for, maybe coming from technical universities and technical colleges, um, both civilian, insofar as civilian academic institutions exist in North Korea, um, and specific military ones. About um, 18 years ago, uh, the FBI, when I was still in the government, the FBI came to me and said, um, hey, uh, people at the North Korean mission at the UN are going out in New York and taking uh, programming classes, should we do anything about it? <laughs> and uh, at the time I said, no, it's not worth, you know, the whole diplomatic hassle. And I think one of the things the report shows is that whereas 20 years ago when it appears to me that the uh, North Koreans decided this was a high priority, um, they relied on external capabilities, whether it was for technology or programming skills, now, I think the shift, and you guys can fill in more, is more on the, uh, they have more indigenous capabilities. So that's interesting. Um, on the, this debate over, you know, are they sitting at the same desk or something, don't, don't look at the individual units. Look at who's in control of them. And that's where I do think you see unified control. Uh, just to touch on what you meant, the shift, that is uh, what our research would show, is that they started outside of country. Uh, programming classes are legitimate and legal. They're a good thing to take, but you can take them home and cause a lot of problems with them and turn that into a computer science industry. I mean, I've seen like the, what is it, like the Microsoft Windows 2000 for dummies completely in North Korean dialect and you print it on North, what is very clearly North Korean quality paper. Um, they, they have a tech, and they have a domestic tech industry to some degree. So you have, it, it becomes a problem of tracking what expertise is going where. It's, it's not like missile technologies where a lot of missile technologies you go, 
that man is making a solid rocket motor. That has very few peaceful purposes for the North Koreans. Um, let's take in C++ while you're outside of countries, and then over 20 years, turning that into a capacity and an expertise. A little bit of sort of detail here. It's if, if when the final report actually comes out, we actually cover um, a fair amount about um, their tech base. So you know things like Korea Computing Center, Pyongyang Informatics Center, and sort of how they're organized, what they produce, you know, how many people are there, how long have they been operating, so things like that to sort of show that a lot of what they are, like hardware, software, like programming language, like not programming language, but like their software, a lot of those are indigenous, indigenously produced, and so they're not, it's difficult to assume that all of these operations they're getting like outside help. 